Welcome back. Few events have impacted the safety of companies as much as the pandemic. The problems presented were all encompassing, causing companies to totally re examine how they provide for their workforce's safety in the face of numerous unforeseen obstacles. Robert Lewandowski, president of Manufacturing Solutions for Fuss and O'Neill, will speak to these challenges and how companies have created the appropriate safety systems in dealing with them and moving forward. Robert? Thank you very much, Philip. As uh, Philip mentioned, um, as we go through the challenges that have been created by COVID-19, uh, there have been uh, numerous standards and challenges that we've had to uh, deal with. And this presentation is going to go through some of those challenges. First, I have a, uh, an offtake here. So some of the objectives that I have, I have four key objectives that I just want to make sure that uh, we recognize as part of this presentation. I want to walk through and identify some of the historical policy and procedure challenges that we've had to deal with throughout this uh, 12 to 15 months. I uh, want to provide a, an overview of the common workplace practices uh, that I've experienced across uh, the country based upon some state federal and other COVID guidance that we've all been recognizing. And then we'll walk through and look at how different companies have adjusted their safety culture and some of the things that they've been focusing on. And then finally, at the end of the presentation, I'll be looking and reviewing uh, some of the things that we need to consider and what we need to watch for as we go into this next evolution uh, dealing with the COVID situation. So again, you know, we, we had to deal with this whole coronavirus rollout. Uh, it happened, uh, if, if we remember back in the February, March timeframe. And uh, again, it's, it's something that surely we didn't expect, but that we've had to react to. So as we go through and deal with corona, uh, what have we been doing? There's been some very standardized and structured recommendations that have come out. Uh, this is obviously from the CDC website, but again, the standard recommendations included things like um, regular hand washing, covering our mouth and nose when coughing or in sneezing, and then there are some other general recommendations related to virus control. Um, back in the early part of the pandemic, OSHA did put out and they published uh, back in April, they published a, a, an enforcement guidance for cases related to the COVID-19. And um, I would reiterate what Galen had mentioned in his presentation. Uh, the OSHA website, the www.osha.gov, is a great resource for going back to look for documentation and reference support for dealing with the COVID-19. So uh, back in April, uh, I, what they did is, uh, what OSHA did is they put out some enforcement guidance. And part of that enforcement guidance, which I think is important to recognize, and that I would still recommend that we review today, is that COVID-19 is a recordable illness. And we are responsible for recording cases of COVID-19, but there are some conditions that we must need to meet. In other words, the case needs to be con a confirmed case of COVID-19. In other words, that there's been medical testing and verification that in fact, the employee has COVID-19. The second step is that we have to confirm that the case is work-related. Uh, Galen talked about your investigation and your information collection. And what I would suggest is that uh, talk to your employees verify that in fact that they were in a situation where they were exposed to uh, another person 
who was also diagnosed with COVID-19. And we, we need to work through validating that, in fact, the case is work-related. And there are some references that you can go back to uh, where they talk about and substantiate what is work-related by definition. The third condition is that the case involves one or more of the general record-keeping criteria. In other words, the case is reported to be an illness, and all illnesses are recordable, that there was medical treatment, and that there was either loss or restricted work time. So again, that gets you into validation that it is in fact a recordable case for your record keeping purposes. When there's ongoing community transmission, uh, employers other than those in the healthcare industry, so you're seeing now they're taking um, a more broad approach and what they're saying here is it is very reasonable that employers in other than the healthcare industry may have difficulty trying to determine and validate whether or not their worker or their employee contracted COVID as part of their work assignment. Uh, and what they're saying is they're going, OSHA will start to use some uh, enforcement discretion trying to establish and validate that in fact the person did receive COVID as a result of uh, a work-related exposure. OSHA will not enforce the record keeping and some of the other obligations we have to make uh, the work-related determination ex uh, similar to what they would be responsible for in the healthcare. What OSHA is looking for employ an employer to do is to substantiate that there is objective evidence that in fact that the COVID-19 case was work-related. In other words, going back and doing your due diligence, interviewing your employee and getting more information on either where they thought they were exposed or information that you have to substantiate that they were in fact exposed. The, evi the evidence is reasonably available to the employer. In other words, you can take the inf information and you can say that on a certain time, on a certain date, that the employee was exposed and that it is a work-related case. And then the, uh, some of the enforcement uh, obligations we still have is that employers, we still need to assure that our efforts within the workplace continually focus and, and uh, reassure that we have implemented good hygiene practices in the workplace. Again, going back to information provided and published by the CDC is one of those ways to meet that obligation. All right. One of the changes that came out was back in April 16, a couple of days later, OSHA put out some additional information. And uh, let's see if we can, let's see if we can look at this. Uh, I apologize. Uh, OSHA uh, understands that there are still challenges trying to figure out what is going on with the OSHA standards related to the health of their employees. And uh, compliance officers are available to help with this and they will provide you the information that you need to make, help make that determination. As part of the screening that uh, an employer will use as part of these efforts, um, compliance health and safety officers will also evaluate whether the employer thoroughly exposed um, uh, the employee to uh, COVID-19 and that they have collected enough information to protect future exposures uh, to those employees. So again, area offices, uh, as Galen mentioned, are surely available to support that determination for employers. And uh, you know, those, those folks are, are uh, willing to help you make that determination. We've had several challenges uh, that we've had to deal with, and, and we'll go over a couple of those challenges that we've observed in uh, different companies, uh, again, across the country and surely in Connecticut. We've had a whole bunch of different rules that we've had to deal with. Uh, surely OSHA has published some uh, guidance information for us, but there are many other organizations that have put out information, many of which have been adopted by states for example, the uh, CDC has put out uh, documentation and I think it's, it's safe to say that um, the CDC is really driving 
some of the compliance obligations and some of the best practices that are being implemented not only by states but also by workplaces. Uh, in our state, the state uh, of Connecticut Department of Public Health put out some uh, very good uh, guidance information. Uh, there was specific information related to higher education and there were some obligations that were needed uh, depending upon uh, the type of industry that you're in. I'm also aware of some companies that put out company specific requirements uh, related to specific rules that their employees needed to follow uh, throughout uh, this whole 12 to 15 month period, whether it was stay at home protocols, whether it was um, uh, medical exams, uh, pre-work screening, uh, and some of those common types of things. So again, which rules are we following? Some of the challenges that we had was trying to meet the obligations of all of those rules while at the same time trying to stay in business. And, and some of those rules were, were in conflict and made it very difficult to do what some of us were trying to do. So when we look at, uh, when we look at where we've been, our success and our program success has been directly related to the planning. And, and you can see the, the quote from uh, President Eisenhower or, or uh, General Eisenhower at the time, but planning is more important than the plan. And I would say, um, even in my time in the manufacturing environment, I don't know that I would have ever planned for a pandemic such as this, but there are many other plans that we would have implemented or would have established where uh, we would have been in pretty good shape. And I think we need to go back to start to look at the planning because in many cases, our planning was not sufficient to address this. And I think we've all experienced that. When we look at some of the things that where we, where we didn't plan for, when we look at resource capacity, and surely this is a, a photograph of an ED, but we, we surely never had encountered uh, anything like this where we would expect uh, the level and the quantity of personal protective equipment that we were going to need, surely in the hospital setting, but even in the workplace setting. Might be very common for us to have, you know, some boxes of N95 uh, respirators, or maybe we have filtering face pieces for, for the dusty environment, but we sure, surely were not prepared for the capacity need that, that turned into what we were experiencing in, in March and April and, and sort of down into the summer. And um, we'll talk about some of, the, some of the medical supplies that we've been challenged to get, as well as space requirements. Think about the six foot rule and how that has affected our ability to do in-house training or to have meetings or to at least collaborate in the workplace. So the six foot rule um, has really uh, changed the way we've been doing business. And one example of that is the form that we're in today. Uh, I can remember years ago where the, the safety and health conference was back at the AquaTurf and we were doing this in person. So just the space and the obligations that we have today have really affected our resource capability and the resource capacity that we have, something that we never planned for. Going to step back a little bit. Here's a, uh, a February publication, again, from the CDC. And, and we're going to talk about some of the things that have been changing because the environment continues to change even today, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, 15, 15 months later, uh, things are changing, right? Uh, the goalposts are moving. But if, back in, in uh, February, the CDC was not recommending the use of facial coverings among the general public. Uh, and we can see, boy, has that changed, right? We can't go into the general public without having some type of face covering on. They did qualify that there may be uh, the need for facial coverings for uh, people who have an increased risk of exposure, but generally speaking, uh, facial coverings were not recommended. And um, Again, boy, has that changed, right? So once, once facial coverings changed and, and the requirements and communication and different uh, outlets, uh, the reaction was 
this type of situation where we looked at um, material collection, I'll call it. I think that's the safe way to say you couldn't go to the supermarket or to Costco or any other uh, outlet to, to get the essential needs of, of what we would have from the home front. And when we look at not only this type of, of material, but who would imagine that we would be paying $10 for a roll of, uh, of toilet paper, right? And, and again, they were now selling them by the roll and, and no longer by the case. And it's, it's interestingly enough that um, there were these segments of how things changed over time where there was, you know, meat was a, a challenge to get. So then all of a sudden, w nobody could get meat anywhere. So uh, things really, really changed in our community. From the workforce perspective, um, the, the face covering challenge then emerged, right? And uh, who would have imagined that uh, you couldn't call Granger and get a box of three MN95s and have them overnighted uh, to your workplace or to your facility so you could use them for respiratory protection of your employees. And, um, you know, face masks now, and, and I'm talking a simple face mask, not an N95 respirator, uh, a box of 10 uh, face masks, uh, as, as the illustration shows, was upwards of $50. And I, I know of more price increases above that during the period, right? So who would have thought that uh, we would be having to deal with this type of exposure and this type of situation, something that I would have never, ever exposed, uh, ever thought about. So the shortage um, that we had by people and organizations and the lack of resources and the changing environment, right? The, the fabric for respiratory protection was changing and it was getting consumed for different purposes. But then we got into what do we do in the medical field, surely, for cleaning and, and reusing uh, N95 respirators. And again, something that from an industrial hygiene standpoint, we would have never had a discussion about was reusing N95 respirators. And now uh, there are full discussions and full studies on how long can we use an N95 respirator? And uh, again, it's that changing environment. What do we do? How do we do it? Um, and, and is it safe for us to do that? Um, and, and then how do we react if we can't get more N95 respirators? Uh, I think Ken, um, when he talked about the ESF uh, planning side, uh, their information was very influential trying to get other uh, adopted uh, standards uh, sort of allowed into the into the industry. Um, we would have never seen a, Ken, a KN95 uh, in the workplace. Now you can't go anywhere without seeing a, K a KN95 respirator. Well, the, the standards are very similar for the NIOSH testing criteria for the respirator, but they're not really the same. They're close, but they're not really the same. But it's today, we've had to make those accommodations in order to uh, meet the need that we have. So we've been pretty lucky. Again, we're still dealing with the shortage that we have of, of, our, of our equipment. So again, back to some of the challenges. Uh, boy, we, we sure did recognize and see a, uh, an outreach from the community. Um, and, and I know from a Fuss and O'Neill perspective, when we were doing training for uh, different type of uh, uh, EPA classes, the, uh, the HAZWOPER classes or the site worker classes, we had a, a backlog of respiratory protection and we made donations to, to local area hospitals because there surely was the need. I know of uh, quilting organizations who would, who would work on uh, uh, sewing uh, face coverings and all these other types of initiatives in order to do the right thing to protect the airborne exposure that was becoming more recognized as the pathway of exposure to, uh, to address our, our needs in the community. So here's a school system that donated 
1,600 face masks and goggles and surgical caps and all the other things that were needed surely by the, the medical personnel or the hospital personnel. So, so those donations were nice and, and, and we, we pat ourselves on the back. The challenge that we create though is in the medical field. Now, how do you keep up with the uh, fit testing or the equipment monitoring, the condition assessment, the employee training? Where are we gonna store all this stuff, right? Um, there are a lot of challenges that, while surely appreciated, that were definitely created by all of these donations and all of the outreach that came in. Uh, in discussions with several of our local area hospitals uh, here in the Hartford area, um, what I experienced was that um, the hospitals were challenged with scheduling work assignments for people as they were working these 12, 14, 16 hour days, how do they share their resources amongst their different hospitals or different locations? So we might have an employee in, in a Hartford hospital that was fit tested for a certain type of respirator or a certain type of N95, and then tomorrow they're gonna to be relocated to another site which would have different N95s available how do we keep up or how does that hospital keep up with the retraining, re-education, fit testing, and assuring that that employee is safe to meet the obligations that that hospital has? And, and again, surely the hospital um, exposure is something that was, was significant. So again, again, back to the healthcare challenges, the donations were surely appreciated, but how now do we deal with this? And how do we keep that straight face test to say that we've done our due diligence to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our employees? So again, some of the challenges. Manufacturing had those challenges as well. Uh, again, now that we've gone to less equipment that's readily available, we've used it, but now we can't get the replacement. How do we stay in business for the conditions or the work conditions that need that type or that level of protection? Again, what do we do for training? How do we maintain the equipment? And how do we manage our production obligations? So there are some new safety systems that we've observed uh, over the past year. And again, th there's been a lot of um, technology. There's been a lot of best practices that have been uh, developed and we're going to go through some of those best practices and we'll talk about what companies have done to roll those out and some of these have been very uh, effective uh, they've been uh, unique and they've adjusted based upon different information that has come out either from their public health department or from the operations or the processes that those companies need uh, for the for their workers I'm going to go back to the the success and in, in, in our ability to plan. It was interesting that Ken um, talked about um, his role in the ESF function and the logistics function. Uh, if you think about where we used to be back, uh, uh, I'm going to say in the in the mid uh, in the mid 2000s, right, 2008, 2009. I'm sure many of us who are in this in this forum had to deal with or had to assess our workplace under the top screen, uh, the, the Homeland Security program that was rolled out. And in that period, if you remember, we were very focused on chemical exposure, weapons of mass destruction, blistering agents, blood agents, those types of things. Our community did a very good job planning for those types of events. Viruses were never on our radar screen. We did a great job with the rollout uh, or the acquisition of resources that were rolled out to our community. Um, mass decontamination trailers, they're, they're sprinkled across the state. Uh, chemical protective clothing, uh, A-level suits, respiratory protection, meters, all this type of equipment that was rolled out for again this type of chemical exposure but not for the virus exposure that we're dealing with today it wasn't even on our radar screen 
Well, it's surely on our radar screen today. So now when we look forward to how should we plan, what do we need to change, I understand that our, our uh, planning for bacteria we need to, and viruses, we still need to look at what's, our, what's the pathway of exposure, how are people going to transmit it uh, people to, person to person, as well as uh, the flat surface to person or other different means of exposure. So again, there's our planning sequence has changed and our success is going to be directly related to our ability for planning and identification. So again, it's going to be a change and it's a great opportunity for us. And there's a lot of resources that are going into this. And I think we can see that in the, and as the vaccine uh, is changing in response to how COVID is changing, right? We've seen a surely um, uh, an identification that COVID is morphing. Well, our vaccines probably will, will follow suit as we, as our technology increases. Um, this is a, a, a local uh, workplace readiness guide. I don't know um, if it's readily available, but I will compliment Cushman and Wakefield. They really did a, uh, a good rollout for their uh, clients. And they came up with sort of this six step process for getting your workplace ready to deal with COVID and then getting your workplace ready to get people back into the workplace so we could get back to some type of normal operation, normal condition. So there, there's a whole bunch of bullets here, um, but generally, uh, I'm actually not sure how easy it is for you to read, but in generally, what they're doing is they're giving you some key considerations and key steps to prepare your building going back and educating your workforce and preparing your workforce. And I think at the time, we surely didn't look at the vaccine or the vaccine programs that are out there today, but I think we should be adding another box to that related to preparing and educating the workforce for the vaccine. Controlling access, controlling access into our facilities, not only for our employees, but also visitors, vendors, um, and other personnel who may be coming in and uh, creating that social distancing plan. Uh, again, we, we've talked about the six foot rule, but really how do you plan for that and how do you roll that out in your facility? And, and again, Cushman and Wakefield did a pretty good job um, rolling out and, and putting in some, some meat to the, to the program that they would recommend. Again, it was, it was a good program. I think they've done a good job with that. Um, a lot of other companies, and this is an electric boat safety bulletin, as you can see, a lot of companies put out their own standardized criteria and they said, listen, if you're going to come to our facility, you're going to need to go through these steps. And I have multiple examples of this, but again, safe, uh, safety and health of the workplace um, really became paramount through the health side and the employee screening and the obligations that um, have really led to what I'm gonna call standardized best practices. Think about it, we can't even go into the community today without seeing on every door or every uh, entry uh, or access uh, uh, platform that uh, face coverings are required before entering this building or this work area, right? So again, a lot of companies put, like General Dynamics, put out a a safety message, a safety bulletin that says, if you want to continue to work here, these are going to be some of the things that you're going to need to do. So again, there was, there's a lot of these. I don't know how many organizations set up uh, protocols for doing this, but as I've gone around the country going to different companies, uh, I don't know that I've gone to a company that didn't have some type of pre-entry obligation. Uh, so that was really good. Obviously, occupancy limitations and, and, and establishing occupancy uh, restrictions in different work areas. Uh, this is from, from Fuss and O'Neill. This is a, uh, an example of a posting that we generated that went into our different common space. So this was in our training rooms and in our kitchenette areas, um, uh, obviously restrooms. And, and those types of areas in our facility where we needed to maintain that six foot 
uh, that six foot distance. And actually it's not just six feet, it's really 36 feet, right? You have six feet on each side. So it's really 36 square feet that we're looking at per person. So when we're planning for uh, how to maintain that distance, uh, we, we did it through occupancy limitations. Some of the other improvements that organizations uh, have done and they continue to do include different improvements to their uh, mechanical ventilation systems, whether it's through increased filtering or through other technologies, say as UV uh, protection. When you looked at the, uh, the uh, HVA system improvements, the occupancy limitation surely improved the amount of fresh air per person as a percentage, right? If you have less people in a room, then there's more fresh air, more clean air for that person. So there's sort of a double benefit there. But many companies went back and looked at their HVAC system capacity and they changed the settings on their HVAC systems so they were uh, uh, allowed to get more fresh air into different areas of their facility. So they would, um, so they would get more fresh air and air exchanges in different work areas. I'm going to go back up to filtering. Uh, I'm sure, and, and we'll go over filtering a little bit more here in a minute, but filtering was a big deal as well. M oftentimes, filters uh, that are used in HVAC systems uh, have a certain efficiency to them. Some are gross filters that are really filtering out just the big, the big things, you know, pieces of grass and leaves and that type of stuff. And what we're looking at now, and I'm sure you've seen, is to see filtering where people are trying to, or, or companies are trying to improve filtering to the HEPA, 97% uh, efficient or 99% efficient for their, for their systems and, and fresh air that's getting returned back into the workplace. Uh, the one caution that I've, that I've uh, always promoted is that you need to make sure that if you're going to increase the filtering efficiency, you need to validate that your HVAC system can actually take that amount of pressure drop across that filter. Are you still able to push through and move the fresh air needed for the occupancy that you're going to have in that building? But again, occupancy limitations, HVAC improvements, and then different technology that's being used has all been part of the changes that have come into, uh, into, the, uh, into the work environment. So on the mechanical systems, I, I wanted to throw up uh, a, 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 an image here. You can see in the upper right-hand side of that image the, the uh, box filter for a HEPA filter or a higher efficiency filter is, is a much larger, it's a much thicker filter. They're increasing that surface area of that filter so they can get a greater uh, efficiency value. So we talked about this minimum efficiency reporting value. You'll see that as a MERV value. So the MERV 6 filter surely does not have the filtering efficiency of a MERV 14 or a MERV 16 filter. So there's a particle size uh, that we deal with when, when, we, when we look at the uh, filtering efficiency. And you can see as particle size changes, and particle size in micrometers is down at the bottom of this chart. You can see that as particle size changes, that also influences the filter efficiency based upon that particle size. Um, one of the questions, and I, th I think I've put it on this slide, is what's the size of the of the coronavirus well the coronavirus that you know there there's there's different information there's different um, um, measurements that have been used but generally speaking the the coronavirus is around 0.1 micron so if if you use that at the bait that is the basis for your filter plans uh, you should be able to look at your mechanical system and maybe something that you could consider would be looking at mechanical system improvements simply through better and increased filtration. And this would be in, in, uh, increasing your filtration for air that's getting brought back into the workplace um, and to make sure that any of that returned air is filtered uh, much better. Uh, some of the challenges that we have with uh, mechanical systems just to make sure that we, we come full circle is that when we have um, 
um, mechanical systems being used is that we, we validate that the system can use the filter, that the system has the capacity to use the filter, and that um, we have the ability of our, uh, that the mechanical system has the ability to actually capture the virus. There have been many studies, uh, many publications that, that show that, when we, again, back to the six foot rule, that at about six feet, sort of the particles that we are exhaling sort of fall out. They, they, they drop to the floor, they drop to that flat surface at about six feet. So the challenge that we have is we've increased the filter efficiency for a unit that is probably located on our roof or above our ceiling. And how are we going to take in the air to capture something that has fallen to that flat surface? That's one of those challenges that we have. So we need to make sure that our mechanical system has the ability to capture that airborne virus. So that's something that you need to look at when you, if you're considering looking at your mechanical systems as a means to, uh, to improve uh, ventilation in your facility. So one or a couple of the other things that are out there. So again, back to publications uh, and employee communication. Uh, we're gonna, again, we're gonna see many of these going across different companies, but symptoms of the coronavirus um, and putting up symptoms so that people know what they should be looking for, not only for themselves, but also for their coworkers. And a common theme that I've seen in the workplace, and that's been out there, is listen, if you feel sick, stay home. And if you see someone who is sick, send them home. And if you get sick while you are at work, go home. So again, keeping that communication going with employees and colleagues so that they know what's going on in the workplace. I think the CDC really has done a very good job providing publications that we can print and use and rotate through our workplace so um, we can keep the information flowing with, with our colleagues in the workplace. So again, uh, back to um, some ongoing information. Seek medical care immediately if someone has some of these signs of the COVID-19. All right. So, and again, there's a, a great CDC. This is one of the publications that I think is very good. And again, we should keep these going. Uh, ba back to some uh, general education related to how to wear a face covering. And uh, we, we see it all the time where uh, people really haven't uh, un either thoroughly understood or have an appreciation for how to properly wear a face mask. Um, whether it's they position this face ma mask below their nose or they don't have it, have it uh, uh, stretched out below the chin or they simply just wear it below their chin. But again, getting education out there so people understand how to properly wear a face mask. It sounds basic. But it's one of the things that if, listen, if we didn't educate people correctly, then they really don't understand because most people have never worn a face mask until now we have the, the COVID situation that we're dealing with. Screening programs. I'm sure uh, many companies, and again, here's a, this is a local company over in Manchester, uh, Connecticut. Uh, they have a temperature screening. So when you walk through the door, stand on the two feet, and they're going to take your picture. You can see the setup that they're using where they have you stand on the yellow dot. They take your picture with the camera. It comes up on the computer screen. It's on that cart. And then uh, if you have your temperature is, is below the magic, you know, 100.9 or 101 or, or whatever the company may be using. They might be following the, the standard guidelines or maybe they've put something uh, more restrictive in place. Um, then they go through a whole bunch of different questionnaires while you're a, a captive audience behind the screen. Um, I've been to this workplace many times and every time that I've gone here, they ask the same questions and they do the same screening. And this company is, is very vigilant about their screening program and uh, it's been very effective for them. So again, one example of a screening program that's been being used. Whoops, I passed by one. Uh, I, I apologize, I, I must hit the button too fast. Let's see if I can keep this one. Here it is. 
Another form of temperature screening uh, that has been used has been walking up to these, uh, these uh, iPod type devices or these camera devices where you stand in front and it gives you the go, no go opportunity. Uh, there's a selfie of me with the, with the uh, I'm screened and I'm good, green is good. And you can see that it's, it's reading right through the face covering. So the face covering is not uh, an impediment to the temperature screening. Uh, it, it might be hard to see, but I had to get my head sort of in the, in the optimum circle so it could uh, really read my temperature. I can't even read my temperature in that. I, I just know that I was green, so green is good. But I thought this was a, a pretty good example. So before you even get through the door, uh, you're being screened and, and recorded, and uh, it's, it's worked out well for them. This company uh, additionally has had no uh, positive cases of COVID uh, since they've been implementing this uh, temperature screening. There are some challenges related to temperature screening. Obviously that there are some asymptomatic or people who are not showing the signs or symptoms of COVID-19. Um, but I think temperature screening is probably one of the easiest ways to, to at least do an initial assessment. There is a facility um, uh, up uh, by Bradley Airport, so a large manufacturing facility. They've uh, performed over 275,000 temperature screenings and they have identified six cases where they had to um, return the employee. They didn't allow the employee to enter the workplace. So again, 275,000 screenings has taken uh, a great deal of resources, but this company absolutely uh, is an essential worker uh, or an essential company with essential workers and they need to stay in business as all of us do. And they took this very seriously. So they implemented the resources necessary to do the screening, uh, uh, the temperature screening that they put in place. Uh, one of the things that we did at Fuss and O'Neill as an example, and, and actually this is probably one of the more common plans uh, that I've seen, in, and this was a, a screening that we implemented back. Uh, we revised it, and as of March, this was the newest thing. It's still posted on our facilities today, where we actually, before you even open the door, you need to do your own self-assessment. And if you answer yes to any of the questions, unfortunately, uh, we're going to ask you to turn around and uh, to not enter our facility. Our receptionist does the same thing. She's going to ask you the same questions. And um, again, if you answer anything uh, in, in the positive or the affirmative, then we're going we're gonna to send you out of the facility. Um, uh, Pre-screening. Oh, so on the pre-screening side, one of the other things that we did is, you know, um, and I'm sure many companies have this, um, Fuss and O'Neill, from a consulting perspective, we visit companies uh, throughout New England and, and uh, many areas in the United States. So one of the uh, additional obligations that we implemented, we use this same assessment criteria and we put it uh, as a screening tool on your cell phone. So every day, uh, if you were not working from home, you had to enter, uh, it's one of our portals, you had to enter your uh, portal on your cell phone and you had to go through the screening questionnaire in order to substantiate that you were actually safe to go and do the jobs and the consulting services that we were doing. And if you answered no, and, and one, of the, one of the examples of the question that we commonly ran into was, have you traveled to a state um, that was what Connecticut considered to be a red state uh, or a state that was a, had a high rate of COVID-19. And if you answered yes, that you've been traveling, then that meant that you actually couldn't go out into the field. You then had to contact your supervisor and you had to go through some additional screening obligations to substantiate why you went to that state and some of the things that you now needed to do. We were very active with um, testing for COVID. Um, there were many of us who traveled and uh, 
uh, through Bradley Airport and at the bottom of the escalator, take a right hand turn to go get COVID testing. And then we needed to not return to work for the three days until we could get the results uh, positive or negative. And if they were positive that in fact, someone came back with COVID, then we had to then follow the restrictive protocol of the two weeks off. So uh, those are some of the things that we did that worked out pretty well. And again, we made it easy for people to self-screen. Some of the companies that, that I've seen now are, are trying to figure out at what point they can uh, return to what I'm gonna call normal operations. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in Chicago, I was visiting this company, uh, Trimtex, and um, they were uh, arguing amongst themselves that at what rate were they going to, as their thermometer goes up, what rate were they going to allow people to come back to normal work? 50% uh, uh, was uh, their initial target. I think they've raised it up a little bit higher, more in the 60% range. So when their employees are, 60% uh, of their employees are vaccinated, that's gonna start to open up the door for more people to come back to work. And again, they are really strongly promoting uh, the vaccine and, and getting their workplace and, and, and employees educated for the value of the COVID vaccine series, or whether it's, it's the uh, Moderna or the, the two shot with the um, Pfizer, or the single shot with the J&J. &J. So again, this is a visual so that they could uh, have their employees continue to promote their, their peers to get vaccinated. Um, following up with um, Ken and, and Galen, uh, this is that national emphasis program that's out there. It might be a little hard for you to read, but um, as Galen had mentioned, um, these are the uh, Appendix A and Appendix B companies uh, who, if you're one of these companies, I would uh, make sure that your ducks are in order uh, based upon your NAICS code, your North American Industrial Classification Code. Um, I've, only, I've only taken a couple of snapshots here, but again, go to the OSHA website, the OSHA.gov, and print out the, the, uh, this NEP. Uh, it, it's, it's actually readable and it, it's, it's easy to follow. There's a lot of protective measures that they use for the um, compliance officers. But again, you can see some of the targeted NAICS codes that they're going to be looking at. And again, I, I, I think this is, it's a good document to understand what they're looking for and it gives you some insight as to, to what they're going to do. So some of the other focus that I, that I think I would, would have offered to, uh, to Galen and to uh, Ken, uh, just upon what I've been experiencing, is to assure that if you've had a COVID case that you are logging it as an illness and all illnesses are recordable. So going back into your 2020 and your current 2021 record keeping to make sure that it's accurate and uh, making sure that your investigations are thorough and to go back and to make sure that if in fact medical treatment was uh, offered or was administered, that in fact it now has become a recordable case. Um, your on-site inspection, if they are gonna come on-site or maybe it's through some type of, of web-based or phone uh, interview, is uh, that you're prepared to talk about your fit testing protocols for your N95 and your training program. What have you done and can you document and substantiate some of the things that, that you say that you've done uh, in your workplace? Uh, I agree with also with what Galen said. Uh, we were all required to do PPE assessments to determine what PPE was required in the workplace. We need to update those assessments to include now what we've been doing for COVID protection. So those are some of the, I think from the OSHA focus side that I would have uh, additionally offered from for Galen and for um, from the Con OSHA perspective as well, so that uh, you're well prepared for uh, any type of inspection or any type of inquiry that they may be making. And again, if, if you have a question, surely reach out 
to whether you're in the Bridgeport office or in the Hartford area office, if you're in that region, reach out to the local area office and get the information uh, that you're looking for. They're very helpful. Ergonomics, um, I believe this is probably one of the hidden exposures that we haven't really taken into account. Uh, again, with all of the different telecommuters and all the different people working at home, we as employers don't have a great understanding of what, what the workplace looks like now. And you know the definition of workplace is really important. Um, and this is our workplace. And so what have our employees been doing at their workplace? And do we in fact have to start to record any type of ergonomic related conditions that really were never considered um, for people when, when they were told to go home, the, the shelter in place mandates, right? Um, or if they were home because of some type of exposure. So again, I, I believe that ergonomics is really a place where we want to go. In the future, I think, uh, you know, you're going to see movements to the sit-stand desk program, to a lot of uh, uh, standing rotation. Th that type of uh, movement is really important. And I think we need to continue to roll this out to people who are working at home so that they're not in that static position. And if ne necessary, we get them the resources that they need. So again, I think ergonomics is one of those hidden hidden things that we really do need to look at. There's been a lot of changes, and again, with people being home, we really don't know what that workplace looks like. So again, getting education programs out there, early intervention, getting people to uh, understand some of the workplace ergonomics uh, and those types of different uh, opportunities. And again, this is a screenshot that we used, it was an all employee distribution. I'm, I'm sure everyone's familiar with those where we've put this out so that people can understand and, and we continually refresh this as part of our safety moment. We start every meeting with a safety moment. So we go through and we talk about ergonomics and our JHA process and that type of thing. So again, ergonomics is, is that hidden, hidden condition. Just a, just a final thought before, before this is our, our last slide, and just one quick final thought that I, I wanted to offer. Um, you know, we have a variety of annual obligations that we want to consider and that we don't want to lose sight of, okay? So I, I just put up a couple of quick items here that I want to make sure that we, we don't lose sight. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but again, these are things that I think you would want to take away to make sure that, uh, you know, we didn't miss one of the details. And again, you know, we talked about bloodborne pathogens or some type of toxic material where we've been dealing with a material that now we have to do an annual training obligation uh, or any of the uh, combined space stuff, depending upon your program. And, and again, you, you can see the list. There's a lot of things here that we have annual obligations for. Uh, I recommend we go back and, and take the time to make sure we've done our due diligence so that we don't miss anything. Uh, thank you. Robert, uh, we do have a number of questions um, for you. Um, the first one being, we spend a great deal of money to clean everyone's office and flat surface areas. Is this really the most effective approach or is there something else you would suggest we consider? You know, that, that's a good question that, that we continue to see. Um, uh, it, when we look at uh, flat surface exposures, um, flat surface e exposures are really, uh, they've been proven to not really be the primary pathway of exposure. And if I were to make a recommendation, uh, my recommendation would be to focus on cleaning the air uh, it's the work environment, it's the air environment. COVID-19 is an airborne exposure. And we need to focus on air as really the primary method of controlling exposure for, uh, for our workplace. So I would look at whether it's filtering efficiency or the different technologies that are available. Uh, that, that's where I think uh, companies should start to really focus on uh, as we move forward uh, and people start to come back to work. Thank you. 
As you uh, and Galen have emphasized uh, the importance of communication, uh, this question is in that light. Our company was lucky enough to acquire N95 masks, and we have ordered different types based on availability. We have never really trained anybody, but did post information on the communication board. Is that enough? So uh, N95s uh, still are, they are considered respiratory protection. And if you're going to be using N95s as a mechanism for airborne exposure control, then uh, you do have that obligation for fit testing, training, and medical exams. Uh, just making sure that people are qualified and, and medically qualified to, to wear that equipment. There are uh, some provisions in the respiratory protection regulation that allow for uh, respiratory protection, uh, uh, respiratory, respiratory protection use for convenience purposes. And if you can substantiate that you're using N95 respirators only for convenience purposes, then you could post the mandatory Appendix D that's in the regulation, uh, and it's available, again, on the OSHA website. You could post Appendix D and then uh, sort of s validate that people are, in fact, wearing N95 respirators correctly. Uh, not all respirators are the same, so I would continue to recommend that uh, don't have just one brand of N95. I would uh, reinforce that you really need to have a variety. And uh, luckily today, I think N95s are becoming more readily available. But again, N95s do have uh, an obligation as respiratory protection. Uh, we have a couple more. Do you have a few quick suggestions that we can use to promote a safety conscious culture? Yeah, I actually wrote a couple down. Um, so, so again, I, I think when we go through the, the, the culture improvements, we need, to, we need to stay focused on education. And, um, and, and, and I don't want to say it's training, but I want to say that let's use the term education. Um, making sure that people understand the value of maintaining social distancing, right? We've talked about it, but maybe we need to reinforce that in our workplace. Uh, so make, making sure that people understand those values. All too often, and, and I think we see this if you watch the news or if you just listen to the radio, the challenges that we have to, uh, for people to understand the value of vaccinations. So we need to, we need to educate people on vaccines and the value of the vaccination series that, that they should be performing or, or obtaining. And we should be supporting our employees to go get that vaccine. Uh, I have heard of some companies offering some time off that if, listen, you want to go get your vaccine and you can get an appointment at 2 o'clock, we will give you the time off so you can go get your vaccine. And I think that's been, been very well uh, received. And again, just reminding people of, of personal space. I think those are, the, those are the values that we could get out of education. Thank you, Robert. You've given us much to, to think about and to incorporate in our safety initiatives in the months ahead. We thank you very much for this very informative this presentation.